Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to see everybody here, and it's a particular pleasure to have uh, a good colleague and friend uh, here from Paris, Sonia Garel, who's a fantastic scientist and a wonderful human being. And it's a great pleasure and, uh, that, that I'm hosting her. I know most of you were waiting for Denis, who's more handsome and more uh, famous, but you're going to have to do with me, unfortunately. So... Okay, without uh, further ado, so um, so you all know that, that the brain is a kind of a xenophobic organ. Um, all the cells that live in it come from uh, cells that belong in that area and they make daughters uh, that, that sort of occupy the brain. And with maybe one major exception, uh, these sort of immigrant cells that arrive quite early um, called microglia. And it turns out that without these cells that are not born there, um, uh, the brain doesn't really work that well. And uh, Sonia has dedicated uh, quite a bit of her career um, to looking at what these microglial cells do in the brain and why they're important and what the mechanisms that regulate their function is. Um, so Sonia did her PhD uh, with Patrick Charnet, uh, and then went to a postdoc with John Rubenstein at UCSF, um, where both as a PhD student and postdoc, she did fantastic work, came back to Paris, to the Ecole Normale Supérieure uh, with, uh, with a sort of um, a senior, senior um, staff scientist position in Patrick's lab, where she spent a few years uh, before becoming uh, a group leader at the Ecole Normale Supérieure since 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, seven, uh, eight, you and, know. Um, where she became director de recherche and, uh, and uh, her own group leader. Um, she's continued to publish wonderful work. Uh, also, mo more importantly, perhaps original work, really things that others uh, don't, don't do much or think about. Uh, role of microglia, not only as immune cells, but in sculpting the connectivity of the cortex, thalamocortical networks, uh, uh, regulating activity, and so on. And so it's, it's, it's always fun listening to, to Sonia and, and, you know, making you think about things that you maybe didn't think about before. Um, she's recently been, uh, became the uh, neurobiology professor at the Collège de France. Uh, which is a very uh, prestigious position, uh, not just in France, but, but globally, uh, succeeding the handsome and flamboyant Alain Prochian <laughs> uh, at, at, uh, at, this, at this position. So um, it's a great pleasure to have you in this series, Sonia, and the virtual floor is all yours. Okay. Okay. Um, Basin. Basin. Uh, introduction. Um, I want to say that microglia are mostly GFP in our hands, so they have a green card. And this is something that we should take into account. Eh? Um, before I, I share my screen, I also wanted to say that I'm extremely happy to be here. But also, this, uh, this is a special week. And um, I just want to say a few words, because we lost uh, Alexandre Daya, who left us way too early. Um, of course, my thoughts go to his family, friends, colleagues, everyone who has crossed his path. He was a fantastic, amazing person and scientist. And um, I will miss him a lot. And I know that a lot of people who had the chance to cross his path uh, will also. So I just wanted to, to, I know a lot of, maybe I saw some people who are there and who knew him and I think it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very sad moment, voila. So I will share my screen and switch to science and hopefully um, get you interested in these cells. So I'm not doing it right, am I? Attends. Share, no, not share. See, now I'm lost. If you yeah. toggle your mouse, you should have a share screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, it's yep. going. Yes. So I cannot see anything but and my you go full screen. Perfect. Okay. Okay, all okay. yours. Thank you very much.
So um, what we're interested in the lab is really to understand how the cerebral cortex, neocortex, that controls a lot of major brain function, uh, really wires, assembles during development. And basically, it involves a series of critical periods uh, during development. And when these uh, critical periods are altered, uh, this can actually lead to a series of neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. And these critical periods really start in the embryo, the secluded, protected environment of the embryo. But uh, actually, uh, these programs can also be perturbed by the environment. And this is illustrated by the fact that, for instance, prenatal inflammation, maternal inflammation that can be triggered by bacterial or viral infection during pregnancy, is a proposed risk factor for several neurodevelopmental disorders. And in, in rodents and in non-human primates, mimicking such inflammation is actually sufficient to trigger in the offspring, um, in the male offspring, behavioral deficits. So really genetic programs, but that can be changed by, by the environment. And during the wiring of circuits, um, neurons are first specified. And we've heard through this amazing uh, series of worldwide uh, neuro uh, forum talks that we, we get to know much more about how these cells are specified, different cell types are generated, et cetera. But in the second step, these neurons migrate. And actually the neocortex rely on a choreography of migration. Excitatory neurons are generated locally and migrate radially. And GABAergic interneurons, which are essential for the excitation inhibition balance, migrate from this subpallial ganglionic eminence region tangentially and integrate to form circuit exquisitely organized with a precise excitation inhibition balance. And in the second step, usually for neuronal population, uh, axonal navigation and, and wiring is essential to, at a broader scale, but also at a finer scale, to associate different areas with uh, specific modalities or also provide salience importance to the sensory stimuli. So really, wiring relies on a choreography of, of cellular movements and uh, uh, extension of processes. And while we have gained a lot uh, about how this choreography is orchestrated, there are still major things that we don't understand. And we usually think about this choreography as a, a beautiful design to build a, a structure that will function exquisitely properly, but it's actually the result of multiple haps and mishaps during evolution that have led to where we stand. And so our goal really is to sort of grasp how this choreography is orchestrated by slightly changing the way we look at this. And we think it's important to understand that because it will enable us to understand how circuits uh, function, but also how they've evolved and how they could be dysfunctional in pathology, how small developmental deficits of genetic or environmental origin can together basically contribute to pathology. And so we build on, on a lot of uh, information known about each of these processes to sort of zoom out and in a way look really at the organ level, at the, the tissue level, how cells interact transiently during development to build circuits. And in the lab, we're really interested uh, in several processes. Um, for instance, we've been looking a lot at the interplay between migration and axonal wiring, and I will just give you a touch of what we're doing on, on the field, and also interactions between neuronal and immune cells, as Bassam was kindly presenting. So just to say a few words uh, on this topic that we'll not present today, when we think about the neocortex, basically sensory and motor information are conveyed to different regions through this relay, thalamic relay, through several nuclei that are reciprocally connected here between the cortex and the thalamus. And once axons arrive in this structure in the neocortex, they go through different layers, but one aspect which is actually has gained a lot of interest in the different uh, studies is that you have a lot of information, top-down information, arriving through these superficial layer one neurons, 
where you have apical dendrites of excitatory neurons. And of course, all these circuits contain also these inhibitory interneurons. And so over the past years in the lab, we've really in, been interested in understanding how uh, interaction with transient population or transient interaction can shape really all these events. And first, we've identified a structure that we call the corridor, and this was done quite a while ago uh, in collaboration with Guillermina Lopez Bendito, who spoke before in the series, and Oscar Marin, who will talk uh, later, uh, in really showing that this migrating population of cells located on the path of axon is actually really important to shape this reciprocal connectivity, showing that migrating cells can display uh, locally, transiently, guidance cues for axons. And also showing that displaying, uh, um, displaying guidance cues that shape the organization of these axons is going to be important to relay uh, sensory information and sensory maps to the cortex. And this structure actually of migrating cells is only transiently interacting with these axons and will then further contribute to actually absolutely non-functionally related a basal ganglia structure. So a nice example of how transient interaction en passant of migrating cells and axons can lead, forge, establish a major axonal connection uh, leading then to uh, uh, building and forging a, a connectivity. Uh, currently, we're very interested in understanding how this structure and information in the cortex sort of have a, an interplay to shape uh, connectivity and the formation of sensory map, and also how this structure regulate, regulates or interacts with the migration of the interneurons. Inside the cortex, we've also been very interested in a small transient population of cell, and we've developed this with, in collaboration with the lab of Alas Alessandra Pierani at the PNP in Medellin Institute, and more recently with Maria Cecilia Angulo, where well, we showed that these migrating cells that are transient and transiently eliminated are actually extremely important to forge apical dendrites and incoming inputs onto these dendrites, as well as a, a migration of different interneurons. And right now we're really looking into what is regulating the time life of these cahal radius cells and how they impinge onto the development of these acts. So these cells are also very transient because they're eliminated, but they leave a long lasting imprint on the way the circuits are forged and assembled during development. And this is really something that we think is, is important to take into account, meaning that anything that happens transiently, even between cellular population that will not even be there or just be functionally related, in the adult brain have to be considered as potentially very important for the wiring of circuits. And this is really following this lead that we started to work on these immune cells, these immigrants that uh, are uh, microglia. And I will switch and focus my talk on microglia. So what are these cells? These cells are really the brain resident macrophages and they have this role in immune surveillance that you can see here. They scan the environment and they can actively react to lesion, infection, uh, disease defects in their environment. And a work from a huge amount of laboratories over the past 15 years has really established that these cells do much more than being immune cells, phagocytosis, producing chemokines, cytokines, interacting with the immune system. They actually contribute really to the physiology uh, of, of, the, of the brain in the postnatal and adult brain. And I would just mention a few of the many functions that they've been involved in, synaptic remodeling, pruning elimination of synapses, but also the promotion of synapses, regulation of neurogenesis, the number of cells that are there, the survival of neurons, and also the survival uh, uh, and formation of glial cells and myelin formation. So in line with, I would say, this really massive role of microglia in physiology, and I should stress that most of the work on synapses has really been shown in excitatory synapses, uh, 
Uh, in line with that, microglia dysfunction has been associated as a causal or contributing factor to about any brain disorder from development to neurodegeneration. So microglia interact with the brain tissue through a series of uh, pathways. And I will just mention a few because they will be important during the rest of the talk and they've been shown to be key for microglia function. So CSF1 receptor and its two cognate ligands, CSF1 and interleukin-34, are actually essential for the differentiation, survival, brain colonization, etc. CX3, CR1 fractal kind, complement, complement receptor, purinergic receptors in general, and especially P2Y12, TREM2, and associated uh, thyroBP, have all been shown to be very important for the interaction of microglia with their surrounding environment and been involved in the postnatal adult brain in excitatory synapse remodeling. Uh, sensing, monitoring neuronal activity or, mon or, um, or um, neuronal health, as well as uh, interaction with the, with the surrounding extracellular matrix and lipids. And in line with what I've said before, um, mutations in some of these uh, pathways have actually been directly linked to the etiology of disease, especially neurodegeneration, such as Alzheimer's disease or uh, late onset um, neurodegeneration. In addition to these functions and microglia uh, activity, another remarkable feature of these cells in the postnatal and adult brain is that actually they've been shown to be sensitive to systemic signals. And in particular, they were shown by Marco Prince's lab and um, Ido Amit's lab and Francisco Quintana's lab that microglia respond to the presence of the microbiota in the gut formed by all the microorganisms colonizing our body, especially they were sensitive to short chain fatty acids circulating or ligands of the iron hydrocarbon receptors. So cells that can really um, do many functions in the neural tissue that are in the parenchyma that are sensors, professional sensors, that act by producing chemokines, cytokines, but also by performing phagocytosis as all uh, macrophages, tissue resident macrophages, and also that can be modulated or that are responsive to systemic signals such as the microbiome. We got really, really interested in these cells about uh, 10 years ago when it was shown that microglia are actually these immigrants. So they were originating in the yolk sac and they colonize the brain very early as the first neurons are produced. So in mice, it's E9, embryonic day nine. In humans, it's gestational week four, five, very, very early. They come from the yolk sac and remarkably, they colonize the brain, stay there behind the blood-brain barrier and colonize the brain as a population throughout life. And this has actually a major consequences. First, it means that during a lot of the embryogenesis and early embryogenic time points, they're the main glial cell population because astrocytes, oligodendrocytes are generated much uh, later. Second, it means that anything that happens to the cell as a population can have lifelong impact. And third, it means that these cells that are there present very early are actually at a key place to really modulate or relay impact of the environment on the developing brain, even uh, in, in the uterus. So today I would like to show you uh, some uh, results, a mixture of uh, published and unpublished, to show you that indeed microglia have early and specific role in the wiring of brain circuits, that affecting their interaction with neural tissue from early stages has long lasting consequences and impact on the functioning, and also that they're very important to mediate uh, these environmental signals. And, and before going on, I, I would like to say that uh, this work has really been initiated in my lab by Paola Squarzoni and has now really been uh, taken over and developed by Morgan Thion. Uh, 
uh, and they're two fantastic uh, um, scientists. So the first thing that we looked at uh, was quite a long time ago was really just to look at where these cells are uh, in the embryonic brain. And what we found was quite interesting, and it had been described in various species, but we, we sort of got into that. This is at mid-neurogenesis in the mouse in this line, 6 3 one gfp that was developed by Stefan Young. And I hope you can appreciate that in contrast to the uniform tiling of microglia in adults, we can see in the embryo really some accumulations and some regions where cells are not present. So a very uneven distribution. I want to stress that these microglia lie in the parenchyma and they shouldn't be mixed with these border associated macrophages, such as here a meningeal macrophages. So the first thing that we could appreciate about these cells is that in the normal developing embryo, microglia exist in a wide variety of morphologies, ranging from completely amoeboid to more or less ramified. And this sort of variety in morphology is normally not seen in physiological conditions in adult, is only seen in disease conditions. So a, a strong heterogeneity during development that actually has also been observed in all the single cell uh, sequencing uh, uh, data sets generated by Beth Stevens and Ben Barris's lab, for instance. As you can see here, a huge variability of microglial uh, uh, clusters and states in development, whereas in adults, it's much more uh, homogeneous. In terms of clusters, uh, basically here, what we can see is that microglia are not only associated with regions of cell death, but they're also associated with axonal tracts. And this is just an example here with dopaminergic axons here in sagittal sections. Dopaminergic axons are important for uh, motor behavior and reward. They originate in the midbrain. You can see the extend and here we have microglia accumulating at the decision point for the axons between the striatum and uh, the neocortex. And in the neocortex, actually, they have a very stereotype pattern of colonization, being excluded most uh, during embryonic stages, mostly from this cortical plate where the neocortex will form, enter progressively uh, through uh, deep layers and then progressively in upper layers until they completely tile uh, the neocortex. And the such of waiting period here in the sublate is actually very reminiscent of other events, a waiting period for uh, interneurons or axons to come in uh, this structure. And I want to stress that uh, these microglia are particularly active here when we look into photon imaging at microglia, where we can see that they're extremely active and interacting with neurons during this waiting period here uh, in the subplate. So a very stereotyped reproducible heterogeneous pattern of colonization, and I want to stress that microglia are much later in proliferative uh, regions. And we wanted to know what they do. And to do that, we generated uh, several mouse models. The first one was really to uh, uh, look into a mutant or a model system where we can deplete microglia. And this has been generated by uh, the laboratory of Florent Ginou at SIGN in Singapore, with whom we've been really collaborating uh, through the years. So by blocking CSF1 receptor, you can basically, as you see by flow cytometry here or uh, immunohistochemistry, deplete mostly or largely microglia uh, brain macrophages as well through uh, embryogenesis. And starting at birth, these cells repopulate from the few that are left, and we have a full repopulation at the end of the first postnatal week. We can compare this transient uh, depletion with uh, mutants that lack myelin cells or with mutants that affect the signaling pathways that I've mentioned earlier, 6 pcr one thyroid bp 2 complement, complement receptors. And last but not least, we can also examine or compare what happens in a model system of maternal immune activation, which mimics a prenatal uh, inflammation here by injecting lipopolysaccharide, 
which is a, a membrane a component of the bacterial membrane uh, of bacteria. And I should stress that this is a very mild model of prenatal inflammation um, in terms of doses and exposure. So when we look at all these models, we can compare and assess what a microglia are doing. And uh, what we found actually, and what we're still looking at is very specific defects that are tightly associated with the localization of these immune cells. Um, these blanks as because we are still currently discovering all these uh, function and assessing them and it's very exciting I should say but uh, a bit premature to discuss uh, but I will be presenting you what we found or just show you a summary of what we found on axonal tracts and then focus more on cortical interneurons and I will uh, sort of illustrate this with the dopaminergic axon. So what we found and this was published a while ago is that microglia accumulate at the tip of these axons and when they're depleted or not there or uh, they, they lack a, a CX3, CR1 receptor, basically we have an exuberance of this projection and that really raised the question of how this is uh, possible. So when we look here in 3D reconstruction or in um, electron microscopy, we can see direct contact between these microglial cells and these progressing dopaminergic axons. And that really raised the question of whether microglia regulate the project pro progression of these axonal tracts through phagocytosis or engulfment. And uh, we've been doing a lot of experiments and these were performed by Guillaume Moller, a previous PhD student in the lab, and they've now been taken over by Akin de Laurence, a PhD student uh, uh, in the lab, to really look at how uh, to really look at whether we could see phagocytosis in situ using several reporter lines for these dopaminergic axons and microglia. And the bottom line is sometimes we do see engulfment, but this is extremely anecdotal and by no means it can really explain the phenotype uh, uh, that we observed. So Akinde Lawrence uh, looked more into details at the formation of these tracts and I will just, he's been using iDisco eye, eye transparization to look at this and I will just uh, show you a hint of, of what he's finding. So here a uh, control, here a depleted embryo. This is late embryonic stages. You can see dopaminergic uh, neurons that progress here in the striatum and in the neocortex. And we can also compare this. So I will show the movies. So the first thing you can see is the depletion is working quite well because we only have very few microglia. And we can really assess in 3D uh, these uh, axonal tracts quite nicely. And what we find uh, is, um, is quite interesting. I don't know if you can see actually, oops, no. Um, okay, this is a mess. Uh, you, you cannot see, so I will run it again. This is a good example of how movies should be run before and after and checking. And so basically what you can see is that in control embryos, you have a certain balance of innervation between, I'm not gonna touch anything, okay. Between, oops, the striatum and the neocortex in the control and in the depleted animals, you can see an extended innervation in the striatum and an almost a complete disappearance of innervation in the prefrontal cortex. And we can quantify this imbalance. So this is really showing that the phenotype is more complex than we actually thought, and that we really have uh, in the embryonic stages an imbalance between innervation of the striatum and the prefrontal cortex that we are uh, following up. So regulation of axonal progression um, beyond phagocytosis. What about the neocortex? So in the neocortex, uh, as I mentioned, we really focused on interneurons uh, because basically in the neocortex, we didn't find so far anything related to excitatory neurons. So interneurons are generated here ventrally in the subpallium, 
In the ganglionic eminences, they come in very different flavors, um, depending on their origin and functioning circuits. And today we'll mostly talk about fast spiking per valbumin expressing interneurons. So they migrate tangentially into the cortex here. And after a waiting period that I mentioned, these axons change, these neurons change their direction of migration, enter and settle, settle in the cortical plate. Uh, what we've shown a few years ago when we deplete, etc., is that microglia located here below the cortical plate are important to regulate or prevent the premature and uh, excessive entry of interneurons into the cortical plate, and that this was mostly related to these fast spiking per valvulin cells. And this is just to illustrate that uh, this sort of modulation has an impact. If we look here, for instance, at in red uh, interneurons generated from the MG, that a large population are these fast spiking per valvulin interneurons in control and depleted, and this is just a few days after birth. I hope you can appreciate that there is an increase in the number density of these uh, interneurons in red. This is exactly the same when you look at the CX3CR1 GFP, uh, the CX3CR1 mutant mice. So when we selectively uh, inactivate this pathway in microglia, we get very similar phenotype. And also when we look at inflammation, we actually have yet an increase of these interneurons. So whatever change that we do, depleting microglia, impairing this pathway. And when we do inflammation, doing many things, including affecting microglia, we basically end up with the same scenario where we have uh, um, an exuberance, uh, a higher density of these interneurons in the cortex. And by doing, um, uh, by examining uh, these somatostatin positive interneurons, we know that this increase is largely due to these fast spiking prospective parvadumin positive cells. So taken together, what we found is that microglia that have a very uneven localization that is highly selective or specialized, uh, controlled by the interaction with the neuronal niche present in the brain, uh, mainly through this pathway, CX3CR1, have multiple functions, regulate the progression innervation of dopaminergic axons, for instance, regulate the entry and density of interneurons that have been actually associated in terms of dysfunction with neurodevelopmental disorder. So we're only scratching the surface here because we see many different uh, functions of microglia uh, early on. But we think that this is very interesting because it's really showing that in addition to regulating excitatory synapses in the postnatal and adult brain, which has been shown in terms of modeling and remodeling, we have a very potent early role on the formation of inhibitory GABAergic circuits prenatally, which is really important for the excitation inhibition balance in circuit. And especially the interneurons that we see affected have been involved as a causal or contributing factor to the etiology of these disorders. And so, of course, that sort of raises the question of what is the consequences or developmental trajectory of these interneurons when we affect early on prenatally microglia or neuroimmune interactions. And for that, uh, we focused really on uh, two models, the depletion model, where again we have a transient depletion of microglia during embryogenesis and repopulation, and this maternal immune activation uh, model in which we perform an inflammation which has many consequences, including affecting microglial activity. And to do that, to assess that, we focused on the system, which is the barrel cortex uh, uh, of the mouse in the somatosensory cortex. So why? I'm sure you're all very familiar with the system. Um, it's a somatotopic map of the large uh, whiskers of the snout of the animal. Uh, and this really goes through a relay, several relay up to the thalamus that release information uh, in the barrel uh, layer four. And in this system, basically the information arriving from the thalamus 
is beautifully sculpted, regulated shape by this desynaptic circuit that involves a parvabumin positive or population of cells, which really shapes through feed forward uh, inhibition the first relay of sensory information in the cortex. And so for us, we thought this is the perfect system to look at what the consequences of changing, of altering uh, uh, microglial activity and look at parvalbumin function because here we really have a chance to assess from very cellular deficits the function of circuits and ultimately uh, behavior. So the first thing that we did was to look really at these PV interneurons in the system. And for that, we use the PV Cre line where we can see all the cells. And we started by looking in juveniles. And what you can see here, I hope you can appreciate, is that from this huge increase in the number of interneurons that we saw just after birth here at P20, we now have a mild increase in both MIA and depleted uh, models. And it is quantified here. But to really look at the function and how these cells were integrated in the circuits, we teamed up with the laboratory of Etienne Odina and particularly Coralie uh, and Mosa. And so what Coralie first started to do was to do paired recording in slices between these pervalbumin positive interneurons and their target uh, excitatory neurons. And I hope, again, you can appreciate that uh, versus control in both MIA and depleted embryos, the inhibitory drive of this PV interneuron to their excitatory target is much enhanced, and this is quantified here. I want to stress that this is also true at the level of the entire PV network uh, that we assess through optogenetic experiments and uh, that I will not present. So a much enhanced inhibitory drive of PV interneurons. So what is the origin or what is, the, well, yeah, at, why is the cause of, of this phenotype of much enhanced inhibitory drive? So one thing that I can share is that it's a, the result of a complex uh, phenotype. The first thing is that it seems like these cells in MIA and depleted embryos have an exuberant morphology. So these cells, are much more ramified and occupy a larger zone. And accordingly or not, but in addition, what we find is that these cells, here when we examine the boutons that they, put, that they uh, make on their excitatory targets, we also see an increase in the number of boutons, so of morphological synapses of these PV cells. So at least two feature, exuberant cells and cells that make uh, many more uh, synapses or more synapses. Okay, so an enhanced inhibitory drive, but the question is how does that shape potentially the, the, the flow of information, of sensory information in the cortex? And so for that, what we did is we stimulated the thalamus and examined what is the uh, incoming input into the excitatory cell. In other words, how is this inhibitory relay integrated in the flow of information? And what we found is that when we measure excitatory uh, inputs, we saw a no change, whereas when we measured inhibitory inputs, we still had a, a, a significant increase of the drive uh, uh, with a shift in the excitation inhibition ratio towards inhibition. So the enhanced inhibitory drive of PV interneurons is um, actually really acting on the flow of information from the thalamus, really from the, the whisker up to the first entry in the cortex. So to test whether this had a consequence uh, uh, in vivo, we collaborated with Isabelle Ferretsou at Neuropsy uh, in Saclay to do voltage, sens voltage sensitive dye. And so what you can do in vivo is stimulate a single whisker and look here using voltage sensitive dye and how information flows in the cortex, particularly looking at uh, upper cortical layers, so the next relay. And this is what you see in control animals. And in both MIA and depleted animals, what we see is a blunted response, which is again consistent with an increased inhibition. <clears throat> 
So all this is actually observed and found in juveniles between P20 and P30 in mice. But so to summarize, what we see is that microglia through selective pathways shape the entry and the density of these PV interneurons, which are dysfunctional in disease. That has an impact on the position and the density. And this leads to a profound miswiring of these neurons and a hyperinhibition. So what happens next? When we look at later stages, we actually see that the number of the cells is not significantly changed. But here we actually a complete reversal of the phenotype. Now when we do pair recordings, we can see that the inhibitory drive of these PV interneurons is much reduced in both MIA and depleted embryos, as you can see on these individual cells. So we basically shift in the young adult, here this is P60, from a hyperinhibition in juveniles to a hypoinhibition later on. And this is actually consistent, hypoinhibition in the PV circuits, this is consistent with what is observed in several neurodevelopmental disorders model. So we wanted to, to test or to assess whether this perturbation do impact a behavior at this stage. And MIA has been largely um, studied before, but we looked at what are the consequences of an early depletion of microglia. And I'm going, not going to show you everything uh, for time issues, but basically we find very specific deficit in behavior in the offspring of animals that were depleted transiently in terms of microglia. One of them is social behavior, but another one was really sensory uh, discrimination. And we could assess that by using a texture discrimination assay where mice normally are trained with their whiskers to recognize a similar uh, objects and presented to a novel object that has a different uh, gratings. And control animals can actually make the difference, showing that they can find or sense that these two textures are different. And we found that in both MIA and particularly in depleted animals, now they were unable to discriminate between these two textures. So from a hyperinhibition in juveniles, what we see is a reversal and a hypoinhibition in young adults, basically showing that between these two phenotypes, we have a step of regression. And for us, this sort of developmental trajectory that we observed was quite remarkable on many ways. So the first one is that basically it really mimics some of the aspects of disease specific regression events that are observed in uh, some autistic uh, disorders, but also the appearance of symptoms in schizophrenic patients occurring only uh, later in life. And also it was really showing that by altering very early on neuroimmune uh, interactions, you can have a very progressive, specific, and biphasic, unpredictable effect of this uh, perturbation onto the wiring of these GABAergic uh, neurons. We also found that uh, it was interesting because we know that genetic predisposition for disease can alter these PV interneurons and their connectivity. And some of these models have very similar impact in terms of developmental trajectory. And in particular, um, there is a beautiful study uh, preprint from the Pratella di Cristo lab showing that PV-specific tuberosclerosis mutant in these PV interneurons show very similar progression in terms of developmental delay. So we think that this is beautiful because it's showing a convergence, not only at the cell type, but also at the developmental trajectory between genetic risks and immune uh, factors, immune risk that could converge onto, onto these, these factors. Of course, uh, now what we want to understand is a little bit throughout life, how these uh, uh, different steps or developmental trajectory evolve. And it's going to be important if you want to think about therapeutical approaches, because uh, targeting uh, early on and hyper inhibited or miswired cortex is not the same as a cortex that has hyperinhibition.
But also, it actually raises the question or the need to understand more how microglia evolve, are shaped, and how they respond basically to a number of environmental factors. And uh, this is something that we tackled by looking at microglia and not only inflammation, but also uh, microbiota. And we teamed up with Florent Ginou to perform a large scale transcriptomic and um, uh, chromatin and morphological analysis to look at microglia throughout development and how they respond to changes uh, in the environment. And this was done on purified uh, microglia. So this is uh, bulk uh, sequencing. I hope you can appreciate from very early time points, yolk sac, uh, E10, E12, E14, all through embryogenesis that microglia undergo a very uh, progressive differentiation and that specific factors are important during these embryonic stages. And this was really um, very similar to what had been found by several labs, including uh, Ido Amit's uh, lab and study. So throughout development, really a sort of progressive acquisition differentiation um, in response to local signal uh, in the brain. What we also found and already was shown by different labs is that during postnatal life, microglia acquire different uh, factors or properties uh, in males and females. So they show a sexual dimorphism, which is also observed in a number of uh, immune lineages. Showing that basically these local signals and the differentiation can be sort of changed or modulated by the body ecosystem, especially sex and age. So to tackle how these cells change or are modified by the environment, we, um, we really looked at these cells and compared them in specific pathogen-free SPF mice that are not really normal because they have a very reduced or simple uh, microbiota and compared with, with germ-free mice that are completely devoid of, of microbiome. But these, these mice are not, uh, are a very, drastic model in the sense that they lack all microbiota and show a number of deficits, but still they do lack microbiota and are important to assess a general uh, function uh, of the structure. And these mice were kindly provided by Sven uh, Peterson. So when we compare, and I will just summarize our finding that uh, were published uh, uh, a few years ago, what we, when, what we saw, or what we confirmed is that in adult germ-free animals, we do have an impact on microglia. And surprisingly, the germ-free condition also impacts microglia at late embryonic stages, showing that the mother's microbiome, because the fetus doesn't have one yet, has an impact already in utero in the immune cells of the brain. What was even more striking is that this impact was actually different according to the sexual identity of the individual. In adults, we found a major impact in microglia of females and in the embryo or late embryos in the microglia in uh, male embryos. Because uh, transcriptomic results can really vary according to the way we purify cells, etc., we wanted to know if this, in a way, was uh, for real first, and also which were the pathways that were changed between embryonic males and uh, females. So what we did was to uh, do um, weighted gene co-expression analysis, and this was done through a beautiful collaboration with Andreas Schlitzer uh, in Bonn, we looked at all the pathways or genes that were changed across time. And what we found is that uh, this is very global, but in male microglia in the embryo, we found that a lot of genes were not induced. This is why these dots are blue. Whereas in adult females, we have some selective genes that were turned, uh, that were uh, expressed at higher levels in red or that was reduced in blue. And when we look at where these genes are or what they are related to in terms of function, they're very different from the embryo or from the adult. In the embryo, we really have cell organization, translation, metabolism, cell morphogenesis. 
and in adults, we also have cell morphogenesis, but it's more regulation of transcription and interaction with the adaptive immune uh, system. So different responses at different stages in males and in females. We also assessed whether this had, we could find some differences in terms of colonization. And this is just to show you that uh, we have at all stages a slight increase in the number of these microglia. I hope you can see. And also they are much more ramified, which is in agreement with what had been published by the Princess Lab. But behind this increase in density, what we found was a profound sexual dimorphism. In embryos, what we have is an increase in males, whereas we don't see much at postnatal stages. And in females, it's the reverse. We don't have much increase in embryos, but we now see it postnatal. So a sexually dimorphic response that we can also see at the morphological and um, colonization level. I should Add that we also saw the same sort of sex-specific and age-specific impact when we looked at chromatin accessibility using a taxic. So collectively, what we see is really a, a dual impact on embryonic uh, microglia in males and adult in females. And I should stress that this is in germ-free, but when we perform antibiotics treatment, we found only partially the same effect, suggesting that this is really a long-lasting programming impact of the microbiome onto these cells. But for us, it was really striking this sexual dimorphism because it echoed the fact that um, disease associated to microglia dysfunction also show a similar uh, a sexual dimorphism. And in particular, neurodevelopmental disorders have a much higher prevalence in males or an earlier onset. And a lot of neurode neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease or multiple sclerosis or also autoimmune disease really have a much higher prevalence in female. And so for us, it was showing, although this is mice and this is, uh, we need to, to really make sure that this is true in, in different uh, species, but this is really showing that different time windows of susceptibilities in the embryo or in the adult can differentially target these immune important cells in males or in females. And so this for us is very important, especially in the context where now a lot of genetic models of disease in mice are being put under germ-free condition. And actually there is a modulation of the phenotype or the progression of the disease we think that this factor that it can go through microglia is going to be uh, important. So I hope I've convinced you that these cells, these immigrants are actually key for our brains, that they enter very early on and they have multiple functions in the embryo and they can have a long lasting impact on the wiring of the brain. Also that they lie at an interface between the environment and brain circuits, even from prenatal stages up uh, to our death. And very intriguingly, they seem to be able to respond in a sexually dimorphic manner to these environmental modulators, uh, suggesting that they could also have a dimorphic impact on the wiring of circuits that would be different at different uh, stages. So I want to finish by acknowledging the people who did the work. So uh, as I mentioned, Morgan has really been instrumental uh, in doing and settling all these uh, uh, in the laboratory. Uh, Akinde Laurence is really looking at microglia and axonal tracts, and I could only show a little of his work. Cécile Bridelance here is working on microglial colonization and how it impacts uh, on the function, I, I couldn't have time to show her results. And we have many different people. Cal Redu cells are really uh, Joanna's uh, work. Uh, everything related to thalamocortical axon guidance uh, from Ludmila and also from Alex and other people who are not there because if we had a lab uh, picture now, we would have uh, basically uh, mask all over. Collaborators, key collaborators, everything related to microglia was done in long lasting collaborators with Florent Ginoux. We did a lot of physiology with Etienne Odin and Isabel Ferrezzo. Uh, 
uh, Stephen, Sven Young was really important for the germ-free mice. Lots of collaborators, Cajal Redisas, Alessandra Pierani, and Maria Cecilia Angulo, and everything related to the corridor early on uh, with Guillermina Lopez Bendito. Fundings. Uh, we also have a number of positions open, and I'm happy to answer any questions if. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, if you're all still there. So I don't know how we should do this. I don't hear anyone. Hi, Sonia. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, you can either keep your slides on or stop the sharing. It's up to you. Uh, so really great talk, very interesting and, and, and um, comprehensive and very intriguing observations for much, much more work to come, I, I guess. It's really very cool. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, so not surprisingly, you have a large number of questions. And what happens is I will read them to you. They're ranked more or less by popularity. So everybody types in their question and other people vote for, mm -hmm. and then the question. Can I are... choose not to answer? No. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> OK, so I'll go right ahead. I'll read the question to you, and, and, then, uh, and then you answer. So. Uh, the first question is from uh, Julia Kaiser, and the question is, um, have you looked at other tracts? I assume this relates to the thalamic do dopamine tracts. Have you looked at other tracts and how they're affected by microglia depletion? Yeah. Such as uh, intracortical projections or cortical brainstem, spinal cord, etc. Et yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something that we're currently looking at. Akinde is looking at. We have a whole... Uh, screen using uh, transparization and, and iDisco. And so everything um, that we see, we see some stuff. It's still in, in cooking. Um, but it's, uh, it's always uh, relatively subtle and specific. So this is something that really we need to, to dig in and to go tracked by tracked to really see what's going on. But yes, definitely. Great question. <laughs> So the next question is from uh, Denise Gasteldo, and the, the two questions, actually. The first is, is there a mouse model in which microglia are completely absent from the whole time, from embryonic stages until, until adulthood? Um, so there is a, a, a FIRE model. So in the CSF1R receptor, um, a model uh, you can actually delete some of uh, hey, this. you can actually delete uh, an enhancer that has a strong impact but you still have some microglia and then there are other uh, model systems where you can conditionally inactivate for instance a pu1 so you will have microglia but as well as other brain macrophages lacking so it's always the same thing. So people have looked at this and they say they don't see much of a phenotype. Okay. Uh, I would, and some people have said, so microglia are useless, you know, they, who cares? But there's two important things to realize. A, some of the functions that they have early on are, you need to really look very specifically to look at the consequences. And B, astrocytes kicking at some point and can sort of take over some of those functions. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna have long lasting consequences, but you need to know where to look at in a way. And this is what we're doing by looking specifically at early embryonic stages and looking then at much later consequences. And so the second question from uh, Denise is, um, are you investigating the molecular mechanisms that are responsible for the alterations in, in her neurons in your models? So why, you know, why do you get, why do you see what you see? Cytokines, mm -hmm. other factors. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, again, very good question. So we've been looking a lot of, uh, at uh, phagocytosis and um, clearly this is not the case. So we're doing, we're also analyzing a large screen or doing a large screen to look at the transcriptomic um, changes in both populations to move forward. So I hope we can have answers shortly. I know I've said that before, but <laughs> things take time. Yeah. 
Um, then uh, there's a question. I don't see the name of the person asking it. Uh, Yajing, Yajing is asking, um, could you speculate on, so GABA transmission is thought to switch from excitatory to inhibitory. Um, can you speculate on, where did the question go? It just sort of got deleted somehow. Wait. On the uh, impact? Oh, there it is. Sorry, yeah. it, no, it just got more votes, so it moved up. Could you speculate on what you think an excessive number of inhibitory interneurons uh, do to this to the circuit? Uh, due to this reversal of the chloride channel. Um. Yeah. So the, clearly this is a complicated uh, issue because we have more cells uh, transiently. It seems to be sort of restored and we think that death of these interneuron population is actually sort of uh, smoothing out the phenotype in a way by rescuing this. Um, in terms of uh, the, the GABA reversal, we haven't directly assessed this point, so I cannot answer. However, we can imagine that this is going to have an impact on what these cells do. Um, but we still think that most of its activity is impacting through um, the building of, of inhibition, in a sense. Meaning that we know that the building of GABA in terms of inhibitory system is going to be really important to shape the activity, the patterns of activity in the cortex, and there's lots of beautiful work showing that uh, from Rosa Cosar's lab and others. And we think that it's probably through this uh, effect that we have something going on. Okay. Um, then there is a question is about whether you see um, alterations in the cytoarchitecture of excitatory um, cells in the cortex. And um, and so and and behind the question is 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 there potentially an is the distribution of interneurons somehow partially influenced by scaffolding uh, of of excitatory of excitatory neurons in a way yeah uh, that's a great question um, so far we haven't seen much in the neocortex but uh, we're looking at other regions so. Again, this is like uh, there are multiple e effects. In the neocortex, the first impact that we see and most striking impact is really on the GABAergic mm. system. Okay, then there's a question from Nidi um, asking about, about the critical period. So, you know, you looked at you see differential effects between embryos and adults, but you also see you use different models that deplete at different time points and so on. So, and I guess the question is, have you narrowed down the time window for which microglial depletion has one or the other effect or has effect versus mm -hmm. no effect and so on and so forth? So basically what we see is when we do embryonic perturbation, we have this long lasting biphasic effect. And now we're trying to tackle whether um, microglia uh, or microglia change in microglial activity could be important, for instance, at this between P30 and P60. So basically we know that the, the, the first impact that we see is between uh, embryonic stages and up to P5 for okay. sure. And then we are testing whether this could have an effect. What is very difficult is that you have, you, we need to, to separate between the, the impact on the neurons and then this is going to, the, the abnormal development of neurons will impact on two microglia right. that then can fit this. forward on the circuit. Yeah. So the, the timing is, 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 is tricky. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, this is this is a really cool question from Yasuhiro Ito, who's asking: Would it be possible to transplant microglia from between sexes? Yeah, between the females and and you know look at look at, is is this really how autonomous is is the phenotype you're looking at? I guess so. There's a there's a very nice uh, work, uh, nice nice publication uh, in Cell Reports showing that at least if you you can do some transplants, you can put them in vitro and you partially maintain the different capacities of these cells. So it's clearly not like uh, an acute uh, response to, for instance, steroid hormones. It could be really uh, uh, something acquired uh, prog progressively. And 
The transplantation is one thing is very interesting, but what we really want to understand is how early the sexual dimorphism is sort of present even at the low, uh, low grade or low level and look, looking back in time. At, at so we still have quite a number of questions. I'm going to try to go through as many as possible. Okay. It's it's 6.07. I think we'll stop around 6.15. People need to... Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sure you, no, no. I'm, I'm sure you do as well. So we'll try to get through as many as possible. Okay, I do short answers with the message. Um, do you think that deple early depletion of microglia affects a program cell death of interneurons that would then occur postnatally? So what we see in our hands is it doesn't seem to be, but they're fully repopulated by P5 almost. Okay, now so it's really before. But I we haven't really looked at whether that during the time window later this has an impact. Okay, um, and this is a question from Abdullah Iqbal who's asking, what about the relative contribution of astrocytes and microglia to to the processes that uh, that you do? you describe where you know is are they partners in crime do they do completely different things uh... yeah so so basically what we see is like we have phenotypes that are specific to microglia depletion early on and some of the phenotypes are gone when astrocytes start to really colonize the brain so we think that at some extent they can sort of fulfill some of the the function that they do but at the same time, they have a very uh, sort of different response or interaction with the rest of the immune system. Okay. So, voila. Partial overlap. <laughs> so the usual. So this is a cool question from Clara Zurai, um, who's asking, um, so organoids, which try to model many different mental processes, like microglia, um, you know, how much are they missing because of that? I guess. Yeah, so that's a great question. Should, so, should, should one add microglia to those? To those definitely. Models? Definitely, uh, a microglia should be added. There's a, a clearly, a microglia can be doing a very different things, and when added, they, they seem to be to be regulating different processes. So I would, I, I think they're important, so they should be added for sure. Okay. Um, so a question from uh, Zoltan Molnar, who's asking, um, he oh. saw a strong accumulation at the uh, palatial subpallial boundary that he sees as well. So what, what is this accumulation related to? Yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're really working on that and trying to see uh, if it relates or it's shaped the tract. Also, other structures that are formed in that region and uh, that could be important related to maybe non-neocortical structure, basal ganglia, etc. So clearly, the cells are doing something very important in that region, and mm. it's something that we can find conserved across species as well. So Astrid Derricare is asking: um, the absence of microglia increase in female embryos is very striking. So that in females, it's only in adult that you see yeah, the phenotype and not in embryos. And, um, but she had the impression that the baseline level was already higher. So as if they started at a higher yeah. level. Then could you comment on that? Yeah, so several work, uh, especially uh, Stacey Bilbo's work, has uh, really shown that, um, and uh, Mark, uh, Peg McCarthy's work, uh, have shown that really the colonization and dynamic of microglia colonization postnatally between males and females can be different. And indeed, it's something that we find, but at a much lesser extent than what's been described in rats. So it seems to be species specific. Okay. So um, this is also related to this dimorphism. Uh, is oh, there any sexual dimorphism? I should, I'm not saying this is a great question, but you know, all these questions are great. Yeah, I no, 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 no. So uh, Yasushi Nakagawa is asking, um, is, is there anything known about the sexual dimorphism in the spatial temporal expression of cytokine receptors that might explain the underlying like uh, il-17 receptor. il-17 receptor yeah this is a good question um it's not clear okay. to make it short it's yeah. unclear i okay. would say in our um, 
There's some hope that we can manage those in the next three minutes. Okay. So um, prefrontal cortex dysfunction, Camilla is asking prefrontal cortex dysfunction has been widely associated with psychiatric disorders. Um, have you looked at those in your mouse model? Yeah, we're starting. We're focusing mostly on the sensory because we think that sensory deficits have been really, really underestimated in neurodevelopmental disorder, but sensory integration, filtering, perception, is something that is a baseline. Mm -hmm. And we know now from many work, uh, including the beautiful work from David Ginty, that sensory discrimination or sensory deficit can really impact on the prefrontal cortex and, and, and be sufficient to trigger pre prefrontal cortex deficit. So we do think we have deficits in the prefrontal cortex, but that is not necessarily direct in a way. Um, so another question from Abdullah Iqbal asking whether you've tried inoculating the germ-free mice with particular types of germs and seeing, but I assume if you had done that, you would have told us about it. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is interesting. We're more looking at the pathways rather than the specific strains. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, Zoe Williams uh, is asking, have you looked into how the microbiota or lack thereof influence microglia? Yeah, I'm presented that. Is, is the guess that it's through SCFAs or some other route? Uh, so in terms of embryonic uh, stages, it's clearly a systemic route. And we are looking at yeah, short chain fatty acids and ligand of the iral hydrocarbon receptors are good candidates. But yeah, okay. the, clearly in the embryo has to be systemic for sure. We, we made it, Sonia, two more questions and two more minutes. So we're, <laughs> we're there. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so uh, Nazim K is asking, um, you show effect on PV density activity um, following microglos no, microglia, that must be, microglia depletion in the MIA model. Mm -hmm. Did you try to rescue PV activity through DREAD or, for instance, to see if PV activity affects microglia in this model? Yeah. So, rescue experiment. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. All this is in, you know, it's like I have all my, my all of the, the project programs. On the, on the, <laughs> the to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then my old colleague from VIB, Eve Sunches, is asking, um, how do microglia know when they are sufficient in number when repopulating and know when to stop dividing? So, you know, so how is the is quorum is, sensing uh, achieved? This is, uh, yeah, Cécile Bredelin in my lab is really working at that. It's a fantastic because it's, it's, it's really amazing how they tile. How they tile, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is, we know very little about that actually. And the density seems to be important because Basically, the coverage and the number of synapses and areas that they do is going to be related to that. And if there is a drastic change between embryonic and postnatal, because in terms of repopulation, you have a massive change at this time point. So all of this is intrinsically and also systemically regulated. We got through them all, Sonia. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience hanging around. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very uh, much for all this. It's fantastic to see you, to see, or not see, but see yeah. that all these people were there. You've been wonderful uh, host. And uh, I hope everywhere around the world, uh, you know, is, is fine. And I look forward to any meeting anytime soon to really yes. get so back. In the meantime, uh, don't forget to join us again next Thursday when Denis will be back to uh, host Oscar Marin, uh, Marine Stock. So that's it. Thanks, Sonia. See you around in Paris, I hope, soon. Thank you very and, much. Uh, yeah, we could even be, you know, we need to. That's right. That's right. We could have been in the same office. OK, yeah. take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye -bye. Yeah, my pleasure. Bye. I don't know how this. <laughs>